Episode 11 was the all-time uh, sci-fi extravaganza. So here we are in episode 12 of the Stratosphere Lounge, and that means that since we did the extravaganza last week, we have um, a lot of catching up to do. So as usual, uh, the whole purpose of the show is to get uh, questions from our Facebook friends who've been nothing but kind to me over the years. It's nice to be able to talk to you directly and answer your questions. and. Uh, that's what we're going to do. And we got a lot of ground to cover because, like I said, we had a couple weeks and out of the political realm. So let's get going. Uh, Ray Malzuski, Mal Malzuski, forgive me, uh, has a question. And, and there's a couple questions that are tied together. So let's start with these. He wanted to know what effect would a pre-election strike by Israel on Iran have on the election? So let's assume that, uh, that First of all, it is Israel striking Iran and not America. Let's assume that it happens before the election, and let's just take that as the premise and not get into why they would attack or any of that stuff. Uh, you know, traditionally, America has um, a policy. Uh, it's not even a policy. It's just a natural temperament. It's probably a good word. That basically says um, we rally around our president in time of war no matter what we feel about him. So your, your first inclination might be that uh, an Iranian a strike by Israel on Iran might help Obama because it would tend to rally the country. But there's a couple different issues here. First of all, it's not the United States launching an attack. It's not us directly going to war. That's number one. Number two, a lot, of course, would depend on what the Obama administration reaction is. I don't think it's a mystery to people that Barack Obama has, certainly not the, a mystery to the Israelis, especially the Israeli prime minister, that the Obama administration is without question the most anti-Israel uh, administration in, since there's been in Israel. So the question then becomes, really, how does the administration handle a strike? Uh, I interviewed your own Brooke uh, at PJTV yesterday. and. He's a former, he's a head of the Ayn Rand Institute. We'll talk about Ayn Rand a little later on tonight. But he, um, he mentioned that uh, it's not obvious to people, but the fact of the matter is any Israeli strike on Iran has to go through either U.S., really pretty much U.S. controlled airspace. Uh, to get there, they can over, overfly Saudi Arabia, which is a U.S. ally, which I'm not happy about, but there it is. There's, um, there's the route that they could take in over Turkey. Turkey is a uh, NATO ally, and of course they could fly over Iraq, and Iraq is, that airspace is controlled by the United States. So, needless to say, if, Ira if Israel strikes Iran, and President Obama does nothing other than offer his full-throated support for the strike, then anything that happens short of that I think rebounds and hurts Barack Obama pretty badly. There is a world, you'd think it's impossible, but let's not forget that the president's closest advisor is Valerie Jarrett, and Valerie Jarrett apparently advised Barack Obama three times not to pull the trigger on bin Laden, and after the third time of not doing it, my understanding is that Panetta and maybe even Clinton said, we're going to do it and you're going to have to explain to the American people why you didn't. Uh, so you never know what's going to happen with these guys. You just don't know. but. It's, it's virtually inconceivable to me, but it is a possibility that you know, there's a world where American fighter jets go up to intercept an Israeli strike on Iran. I don't think anybody thinks that's really going to happen. But do, do the Iraqi government officials squawk about this Iranian incursion? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Israeli incursion? Undoubtedly they would. What would our response to that be? I think if Obama does anything less than really get behind this strike, it's going to hurt him badly. It's going to hurt him badly. And um, that's the calculation. We get a, a similar question, I think. At least it's, a, it's an interesting angle that I'd like to cover from Raphael, uh, Raphael Leibovitz who says, uh, Mr. Whittle, very disturbing story out of Germany this week. A rabbi is being prosecuted for, por for performing a brie on an eight-day-old baby as prescribed by the Bible, uh, presumably by the Torah or the whatever. But in any event, what are your thoughts on the rising anti-Semitism that is sweeping Europe, and do you think the trend will continue here in the U.S.? I think that's a really interesting question, this anti-Semitism question. Uh, I was talking with Yaron, I guess, as I said yesterday, about Iran and, and about the Middle East and about about the 
the, the burning hatred in the heart of the Arabs, the insane hatred towards Israelis. I don't know if any of you saw this thing that was circulating a couple weeks ago, but it was clips from an Israeli game show. It was kind of like candid camera. It was a gotcha show. It was a, you know, like a punked. And they had uh, Arab people come in for an interview. They thought the interview was for like a German TV, and then they revealed that it's Israeli television. And all of these Arab intellectuals and deep thinkers and celebrities get violently angry. When I say violently, I mean like throw chairs. One guy punched the woman who was hosting, you know, punched her in the face when he found out that she was Israeli. And then, then of course, the, the, the host says, no, no, it's all a joke. It's all a joke. Punked. You know, gotcha. We're actually Arabs. Oh, ho, 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 ho. big hugs and laughs all around. These people hate the Israelis in their bones, and there's a lot of hatred of the Israelis in their bones in Europe, of Jews in Europe. There's a lot of hatred of Americans in Europe and around the world, and I think all of these things are related. And I think, to take the clearest case and then work it out from there, I think it's pretty clear. When I was a boy, my mom grew up in the Middle East. My mom actually was... Uh, barely escaped with her life during the uh, Suez Uprising. My grandfather, her father was in Royal Naval Intelligence, was a Royal Marine, uh, and he was stationed in Egypt during the uh, Suez Crisis. And they tried to try to murder him. They barricaded themselves inside a PX, basically, and went up to the ceiling with these giant cauldrons uh, that they used for washing, and they were boiling water to pour down the stairs when these, when these hordes came up to put their heads on pikes. And that was my mom. She was probably 12 when that happened. But my mom grew up in, in the Middle East and, and saw all of this, saw Israel pretty much right when it started. And I was very young, I was probably 10 or 11, just driving the car, going someplace, and the subject came up and she said, you know, if you stand on a high ground in, in, the, in the Middle East, you can look down, and it's like somebody drew a line on the desert with a ruler, and one side is green and cultivated, and the other side is a wasteland, and the green side is Israel, and the wasteland is are the various Arab states. Um, I think, I've never been afraid to just say what's on my mind, so here it is pretty much verbatim, or at least without any uh, gilding. I think every single day, the Palestinians wake up, and the Egyptians wake up, and the Jordanians wake up, and the Syrians wake up, and they look across the border, and they see success, prosperity, freedom, um, win. They see winners. and that is intolerable to them. It's intolerable. You, every person, every society, I, had a, a, I met a really interesting guy up at uh, Coeur d'Alene when I was visiting Bert Rutten's small little deviation here named Brent Regan. Brent Regan talked about, uh, he talked about uh, fractal behavior. He, he, his idea was that um, the behavior of individuals mimics the behavior of the culture and vice versa. The way the individuals in the culture behave is how the culture behaves. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and when you deal with people who would rather point the finger at somebody and blame somebody, would rather would make that decision rather than doing the infinitely harder work of actually succeeding, you have a certain kind of person. And not to put too fine a point on it, you really have uh, the progressives and the Occupy Wall Street, right? It's easier to demonize people who are successful and to demand their stuff than it is to actually go and earn that stuff, isn't it? And this is one of the reasons why P.J. O'Rourke was such a profound influence on me, because P.J. O'Rourke just said something very simple. It's much easier to legislate other people's money than it is to go make your own. Absolutely right. So when you've got a culture that's that dysfunctional, as you have with all of these Middle Eastern Arab states, they could live with their dysfunction as long as they didn't have to face their dysfunction. But every day, they get to wake up and look across that border, figuratively or literally, and see success. And they can complain about how, how poor the land is and how hard it is to farm there and all these things. It's a terrible, it's a terrible country in terms of the actual soil. But ultimately, what happens is they wake up every day and they see people who do the hard work to become educated, to get up earlier, to stay up late, to go out and irrigate the desert. Israel is a Western country. I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again because it's a really essential thing that, that we need to understand. I remember this came to me like a, that's a line from Apocalypse Now, like a diamond bullet right between the eyes. 
you look at the third world, and Arab countries are third world countries, you look at the third world mindset, and you think, what's wrong with those people? But that is not the way to think about it. There's nothing wrong with those people. That's how things have always been done forever. That's how human beings have existed forever. The question is, what's wrong with us? We're the ones who are the freaks. They're not the freaks, we're the freaks. It is an abnormal, unusual, a an historical way to think about things, to think that you can make things better than they were before. The idea that you can that you can improve things is a is a relatively new idea. It's a Western idea. And Israel is a Western country. I did an afterburner uh, called The Bridge in Your Mind where I talked about the uh, bridge over the River Kwai and it was written by a French guy. Uh, whose, uh, whose name escapes me right now, and I'm embarrassed about that. I usually remember these things. But he basically said that the reason that the British built such a good bridge when the Japanese hadn't was that the Japanese just marched off into the jungle and lashed some bamboos together, and then um, the bridge would last for a train or two, and then it would collapse, and they'd go do it again. But the British built the bridge in their minds. They had the vision to see the bridge, and they did all the mental calculations. How much weight will it support? What kind of sand are we building into? How much timber will we need? In what order will we mark the guys out there? What teams do we need to assign, and in what order? You, Before the British went out to, to drive the first nail in the actual bridge, the bridge was finished in their heads. All the blueprints were done, corrections changes, it was criticized, all this stuff. This is Western thinking. This is what the Israelis do. The Arab looks out over the desert and sees a desert. An Israeli looks out over the desert and sees an orchard. And that must make the Arabs crazy. And it makes them crazy on another level, too, because if you really get into the message of Islam, uh, I'm not admitting this. I didn't write the Quran. I'm just telling you what's in the Quran. The Quran is a, is a very unusual religious document in the sense there's not a whole lot of religion in there. It is a it is a mostly historical textbook for conquering people. There's a lot in in um, a lot in Islam in the Quran that is really just how do you deal with conquered people? What who do you let live? Who do you put to the sword? Who what 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 are the terms and conditions for allowing them to live as dimmies and what's a what's a hudna, what's a false truce, what's all this stuff? Um, but the main thing about Islam is, as many religions do, as certainly as Christianity does, and as certainly as is, as uh, as Judaism does, it tells their tells their followers that they're the chosen people, that God has smiled uniquely on them. It's got to be a pretty cold thing for a for an Arab in Syria or Jordan to uh, wake up to every day, doesn't it? You've been told your whole life that you're the chosen people, that that Allah is um, is is your is your guy and um, he's going to smite the unbelievers. And then you look across the desert and you see the most hated unbelievers of all living well on your, uh, living well on the land that you cannot make work. And I've often said that the main reason that they, that uh, Islam launched the attacks on, on us in nine, in, on 9-11 is because the existence of America proves their religion is a lie. To them anyway. Just uh, let, let's not even take America, because that, that's a pretty broad, uh, pretty broad uh, canvas. Let's say Vegas. Las Vegas, the existence of Las Vegas is um, really disturbing to, uh, to Muslims on a theological level, because certainly they know how we live. They know that they live in poverty, they live in repression, they know that they live in, in, in just abject misery. But they're the chosen people. And meanwhile, the infidels, the, the infidels, the sinners here in America, whose women are barely clothed and, and who, you know, believe in things like free speech and criticizing the prophet and all these other things, these infidels live like kings. That's why we had to be destroyed, I think. I really think that's what the essence of it was with the 9-11 attacks. Our existence proved to them that their God is lying to them because how can we be this successful and this happy when they're the chosen people and we're the unrepentant sinners? We're doing everything that the Quran tells them not to do and we're having the time of our lives. Uh, all of this simply to say that the, the anti-Semitism in the Middle East with the Arabs and even the anti-Semitism in Europe is a result of envy. It's envy. That's all there is to it. All of socialism is built on envy. 
Socialism is the theory that it's better for everybody to live in misery than it is for some people to be less miserable than others. In other words, even if the most miserable people in society do better and better and better, there are some people who are so full of envy that they simply can't accept it. I'm going to give you a little insight into, uh, I don't think I've talked about this before. It's going to be in the next firewall. Uh, I've got a firewall coming out called number six, which is about envy, and it deals with the tax issue. But there's a little thought. I know I'm getting way off topic here, but that's why this is a fun show. Um, so I, I did a little thought experiment to deal with envy and to try to explain how socialism works in terms of an emotional reaction, because we all know how it works intellectually, but an emotional reaction, it, ultimately getting back to anti-Semitism. So give me a second here. So here's a little thought experiment I came up with. You guys might get a kick out of this. Here's how, there's, here's how that flaw in the human heart works. Let's say that you work for an insurance company and you live in and you have a little cubicle and you're one of a hundred people on an insurance floor and let's say that at the end of the uh, of the day on Friday you're getting ready to go home and the president of the company comes by your cube and he says hey Bill I'd like to talk to you for a second yeah well, I'm sorry what can I do for you Mr. Johnson Bill you've been working for this company for 20 years now and I know you don't know it but we've been watching you you come in early you stay late you work hard you've been a credit to this company you you've made us ton of business you've put out all kinds of fires and we just wanted to let you know that we wanted to show our appreciation and we want you to have this check for a hundred thousand dollars and the taxes have been paid on it we already paid the taxes on it so it's a hundred thousand dollars no strings attached not a gag and it's not a joke we just wanted to thank you for all your for all your hard work have a great weekend and off he goes and there's the check in your hand well needless to say if somebody just dropped a check on you for hundred thousand dollars, you didn't have to do any extra work. It's done. It's yours. It's an. It's the definition of a windfall. What What do you do? You're You're filled with joy, right? You're filled with joy. The first thing you think about is all the things you can do with that money. I could pay off the, the house maybe, or I could get a new car, or I could uh, pay for the kids' education, or I could get a flat screen TV. I go around the world, and you're filled with joy. It's a hundred thousand dollars you had no idea was coming and you are filled with nothing but absolute radiant elation and joy so needless to say once the boss has left you decide to go and share the news with the rest of your co-workers and you go out there onto the floor and you pull your friends together and you say you will not believe what happened to me what happened the boss just came by said he'd been thanking me for all my work and he gave me a check for a hundred thousand dollars pure gain and then everybody else in the office tells you that the boss had come by their cubicles before you but they didn't get a check for $100,000. They got a check for $300,000. Now what happens to your sense of joy? You instantly go from being overjoyed and elated to being miserable and unhappy. And you no longer think about what you could do with $100,000, but you start thinking about what you could have done with $300,000. And all the people who you wanted to take care of with your $100,000, all your old friends who you used to work with, the guys you're going to, ah, you know, he really wants a motorcycle. I can, I can peel off, I can peel off, you know, $250 to get him a used motorcycle. All the things you wanted to do, suddenly that all changes. You suddenly start looking at the other people in your office, the people who got the 300 grand, well, you got a measly 100 grand. You know, Susie, she drinks and, and, and Ted comes in late and leaves early and he got 300 grand and I didn't get 300, I got a measly 100 grand. How come they got 300 grand? I didn't get any, and I, I got this, this crap. That's because you didn't earn it. At least you didn't earn it the way that we traditionally think you earn about it. It was a gift and therefore, since it's a gift, it goes to your self-worth. And if somebody else has more than you do, you don't think about how they earned it you become less than them and you're filled with envy. Now, if that had been set up in such a way where the guy who put in the long hours got 300 grand and the person who left early and came in late got 100 grand, you could find a way to be okay with it. But since it's not tied to reward, since it's just a gift, it's an entitlement, you are filled with envy. And I'm here to tell you that there are people out there, I'm not one of them and you're probably not them either, but the fact of the matter is there are people out there so that if the deal was structured in such a way that everybody had to take the check or else nobody got the check, there are people out there, I'm telling you, that would rather tear up a check for $100,000 than bear their neighbors getting three times what they got. Those are, that's envy. That's what envy is. And that's what drives anti-Semitism in Israel, in, in the Middle East, and it drives it in Europe. Um, 
the anti-Semitism in Europe goes back a long, long way. Mark Twain wrote a really incredible essay on the Jews, incredible essay. He basically said that the hatred towards the Jews, this is pre-Holocaust, needless to say, was based on the fact that they were just so damn successful that he said there have been religious prosecutions throughout history in Europe, but nothing like the Jews. And he, Twain's con conviction was it was the success of the Jews that generated such hatred. The fact that people felt they couldn't compete against them was why they were trying to lock them up and, and not allow them to own businesses. It wasn't so much because of the religious thing and the whole crucified Jesus is a fig leaf for the fact that they didn't want to compete with them, that these Jews were putting them out of business everywhere they went. And because they're so educated and so uh, so focused on competence in so many ways, you don't see poor Jewish people, you don't see Jewish beggars, been my experience. Um, so I think that's what drives it. I think it's envy. And this gets me to another question, which I put together a couple years ago. I've been th thinking along these lines for a while. Uh, Michael Russell asks, I want to know why people in other countries seem to hate America so much, and I think it's the same thing. I think it's the same thing. I know my brother lived in Ireland for a while, and then he lived in London on the uh, East End, poor part of town. And he basically was working there, and he was wor hanging out with working class Englishmen in the, in the East End of London. And he had an American accent, needless to say, and he every time he'd open his mouth somebody they like Steve personally but there'd be some comment about Yanks in America and how awful Yanks are and how awful America is and all oh, blah 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 and then Steve said I'm going back to America he said I'm going home and everybody wanted to go with him everybody wanted to go with him that isn't that interesting don't you think it's weird that if you ask anybody in a pub in Germany or in England or in Greece or in Spain or in Ecuador or in wherever and you say oh you'd hear uh, yeah I'm an American you'd hear nothing but hatred you'd hear nothing but but rage and 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 you know all of this vitriol and then if you said and by the way I have here two complimentary green cards anybody interested what's that about See, that's, that's, what, that's what's so interesting about this whole thing. If it was genuine, if it was, a, if it was powered by a genuine disgust and, dis, and disdain of everything we are, and certainly there are those people that believe this. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of plain out communists in, in Britain, for example, George Galloway and these guys, and, you know, these guys don't love America secretly. They don't secretly want to live here because they got the means to, but that's the 1-2% the of, the, of the intellectual scum that floats to the surface of that pond talking about the common people of those countries. They will fill you with disdain for America, but if you gave them an opportunity to come to America, they'd be here in a heartbeat. And there's a mirror of this as well. And the mirror is all of the anti-American limousine liberals who do nothing but disdain this country and talk about how miserable and crass and awful and evil and nasty and George Carlin is prince among these people just the this just this 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 reeking self-hatred and loathing of this country by Americans but these are people of means these people live anywhere they want they could live in Sweden if they wanted to they don't why why it's all crap that's why it's all crap it's all crap so I think that the anti-semitism in in Europe was driven by envy of Jewish success and I think that the reason that Europe vilifies the Jews so much and makes them you'll hear nobody talks about Israelis being war criminals like the like the Europeans and I have a very clear opinion on this my friends my feeling is when you hear Germans let's say talking about Israelis as war criminals if Israelis are war criminals, then gassing six million war criminals is not quite as bad a thing as it would have been if it was gassing six million uh, musicians and doctors and surgeons and philosophers and moms and dads, right? The more evil Israel becomes in their eyes, the less evil the great evil becomes. In contrast, right? That's how it looks to me. I really think that's driving a lot of it. So it's not only envy, it's guilt. And when you deal with guilt and envy together, that combination is the single most homicidal combination on the face of the earth. That is what has killed 150 million people. Envy and guilt. So 
that's what I think about the situation with Israel. And, and if, uh, if Israel attacks uh, Iran, I don't think that the anti-war president and the anti-Israel president gets the kind of solidarity bounce to lock up the election that George Bush got when 9-11 happened when we were attacked on our own soil by a foreign power. You could make the case that uh, Jeremy Boring makes the case that if, uh, if Israel goes to war with Iran prior to the election, then the electorate will essentially look around and say, where's the nearest Republican? We're in real trouble now. We'll see. Let's move on. Um, Brian, D. McCain, Brian D. Cain says, my question for you, Bill, and probably one of one many are curious about is, was Romney's choice of VP pick Paul Ryan a good one? What makes him better than others, such as Chris Christie and so on? We didn't get a chance to talk about Ryan because the Ryan pick happened and then we did the sci-fi spectacular. And so we got a bunch of uh, Ryan questions there and I picked three of them, so we'll, we'll take them one by one. Is Ryan a good choice? I've been, I've been saying for a year that it had to be Ryan. I didn't think it would in a million years would have been Ryan, but I was praying for it to be Ryan. And I was saying it had to be Ryan because I've said this on uh, on the afterburner I did on Ryan. The only actual genuine um, existential threat to America on the board today is not global warming. It's not Iran with a nuke. It's not uh, falling education scores. None of those things. The only thing that can actually destroy America as we know America is this debt crisis. And it not only can, it will. It will bring down the economy of the world and change what we understand our lives to be in a way that none of us are prepared for. Because when you had the Great Depression, you had people out of work and you had people living in soup lines and without electricity and stuff. But those were tough, tough, tough people. Those were people where uh, 60, 70 percent of the country was rural. A lot of people didn't have electricity. Many people didn't have electricity in the 1930s when we had the Great Depression. If we lose the power, if the power, forget if the internet goes out, if electricity goes out, if, if food can't be distributed, we're not living on farms anymore. It's not 60% of the population's uh, rural. It's 5%. Um, it's the end of the world as we know it. It's, 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 it, it's not a catastrophe. It's, it's unknowable. It's, it's the singularity. We can't see what would happen if the world's economic system collapses. And it is going to happen. This is the most predictable catastrophe in human history. It's going to happen unless we get this spending and this debt under control. And I've been saying for a year now that I would rather lose with Ryan than win with somebody other than Ryan. And, I'll, and I know that's a hard thing to say because first of all, I don't think we're going to lose with Ryan. I think we're going to win and win and win big with Ryan. And I think everything's panning out that way. But here's why I think this is important. If we lose with Ryan, the only person out there who's serious about this plan, I've had many people correct me and say Ron Paul has a serious plan. To, to the Ron Paul people, I apologize. That is correct. I said on the afterburner, was, Ron Paul is talking about these things. So my sincere apology in that regard. With that said, um, Ryan's plan is a path to fiscal sanity. And we have to put a marker down for fiscal sanity. It, we are dealing with people who are so mendacious and so cynical and so power hungry and crazy that I honest to God think it is better not just forget for the Republican Party or conservatives. The future of America is dependent on us going to the American people before this collapse and saying we have a choice. We can be adults like they were in Wisconsin. We can face the music and we can get a haircut and we can start to get better or we can be France and Greece and pretend like there's no problem and reelect the guys that, that tripled or quadrupled the, the, uh, the deficit. So which is it going to be? The reason that's important is if we win, it becomes a mandate for change. If we lose, it means that when this collapse happens, it's not just as something as, as petty and trivial as we told you so. No. Then when the collapse happens, the American people will realize that they made a mistake. And most people, most cultures learn through pain. So if we have to get a little pain, if we've had enough pain, we can get out of this without a whole lot more pain. If we don't have enough pain now with four years of unemployment and all the rest of this, then maybe we need real pain, punch in the nose, break your nose, blood running down your face kind of pain. And if that's the case, then the American people need to know who told them the way out because not because it'll be time to t say I told you so, because then it will be time for people to go to plan B, which is who are the adults and who can help us out of this? 
That's why. That's why. That's why Ryan is so important. Uh, Ryan, I don't really want to get into the, all the tactical things about Ryan. Ryan's a real conservative. I'll, I'll tell you this. Ryan certainly energized the base in the same way that Sarah Palin did. R Ryan is an, uh, I think I have, a, I have enormous respect for Sarah Palin, but I think Ryan is a far more formidable person. But I think of all the things that the Ryan pick does is it makes me feel much, much, much better about Mitt Romney. I know like all of you conservatives out there, you're pretty tired of getting, you know, just getting the finger from the GOP establishment. Yeah, you guys don't count. You're only the conservative wing of the conservative party, right? So for Ryan, to be chosen by Mitt Romney says it says more about Mitt Romney than it does about Ryan, and I think it's going to be spectacular. There is no question that there's no question that American businesses are sitting on tons of money. There's an enormous amount of private capital out there waiting to be spent, and they're not spending it, and rightfully so. They're not spending it because these these Marxists in Washington. I've demonized business, demonized uh, prosperity, demonized success. So rightfully and sensibly, companies are sitting on money. They're not hiring people. They're not buying new trucks or opening new factories because they don't know what the tax rate is. They haven't even passed a budget in three years. They can't predict it. And uh, Jeremy made this point. He said it's better to have a high tax rate that we know is coming than it is to have an unknowable tax rate because businesses have to plan ahead. So if Ryan and Romney... Romney and Ryan are elected in November. I predict the the Dow is going to jump 5,000 points overnight, and before he's inaugurated, the economy is going to be up to four, five, six percent in growth because of this. Now, of course, needless to say, all the liberals will say it's racism, and Obama has already gone on record as saying he doesn't want Ryan. I'm sorry, Romney. <laughs> it's he doesn't want Romney elected because Romney is going to get credit for the economic recovery, which is going to be here just any minute. So if Romney is elected and the Dow jumps 5,000 points the next day and everybody starts hiring, Obama would have said, man, if that election had only happened a week later, I would have won. That's how clueless this guy is. I don't care about him being clueless. You know, we talk about Jimmy Carter being the worst ex-president in history. Barack Obama is going to be the worst ex-president in history starting this November because once he's out of office and the economy, which is a coiled spring of potential energy, energy just waiting to go, once they take their their cut the chains off of our own ankles and the economy explodes, Barack Obama is going to be on TV every day for the rest of his life starting on the first Wednesday in November talking about how, oh, all of this is a result of me and my policies and the American people just sold me out just before we had a chance. All this prosperity is mine and now Romney's taking credit for it. And you know what? As infuriating as that is, it fills me with a special kind of joy because it means that guy is going to spend the rest of his life bitter and angry and mean-spirited and small, which is what he is anyway. And um, I want to see him. I want to see his face after eight years of economic growth at 8% a year because of his policies. We win this thing in November, and Barack Obama will go down in history as maybe the, the, the best thing that ever happened to the United States because he's shown us what actual socialism is and convinced us we don't want any of it. Um, on the Ryan plan, uh, on the Ryan selection, Nick Razo has a question. That says, "What does Paul Ryan do to dismantle the cultural perception of him as a granny-killing Medicare assassin that the media is trying to put on him?" Well, isn't it just been a joy since um, Romney's mathematical nomination? To watch the Obama administration pull one shiny object out after another, the dog on the car and the war on women and, you know, blah, 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 only to have it blow up in their faces. This Paul Ryan thing, which they assured themselves would be a catastrophe, would be an automatic victory for them because seniors won't stand for it. You know, they, they're so protective of Medicare. Isn't it just hilarious and joyful and hopeful? Isn't it a good thing, a hopeful thing for this country? that the American people, especially seniors, are not only not reacting negatively to Ryan, but have been adult. They're adults. They're saying, oh, somebody wants to talk to us seriously about a serious problem. We like this guy. So the cultural perception of him is being dismantled, not through a strategy, but it's being dismantled because of Ryan. You listen to Ryan talk for half an hour, and you think, man, that guy's going to be president. We had a a small event with him not long ago. I, I wasn't able to go, but I know a lot of people who did. They said the striking thing about listening to Paul Ryan is you listen to Paul Ryan, and half, you know, 10 minutes later, you think this guy's going to be president because he has all of the qualities that Americans like in a president. He's competent, he's, he's quick, he's informed, but primarily he's happy, he's confident, 
he's an optimist and he's friendly. Happy warrior is the key to America. And Barack Obama, of course, doesn't understand enough about America to, to get that. But that's what Barack Obama's image was. We all know what he really was, but we know his image in 2008 was he's a happy warrior. He's a nice, friendly, you know, happy-go-lucky guy who's, there's no white America, no red America, blue America, there's only one America. Blah, 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 blah. Happy warrior. Well, now we've had four years of happiness, and we see he's not happy, and he's running this negative campaign, and this negative campaign is destroying it's destroying the only advantage that Barack Obama has, which is his personal likability. Every single time another one of these nasty negative ads comes out with his name on it, and then likability goes down. Romney's going to clean the floor with you. We're going to win these guys. We're going to beat him by seven to ten points is my prediction. Five points minimum. We're going to beat him by more than they can cheat. Mark my words. So, yeah, you don't have to come up with a strategy for Paul Ryan's image to change. All you have to do is listen to Paul Ryan. That's why the truth will set you free, my friends. And that's why if, if they're neck and neck now, forget about all the spending and the super PAC money that Ryan has been saving and hoarding. Barack Obama is still down in some national polls after spending all of his money unchallenged. When Romney's spending advantage kicks in, and especially when the debates happen, the wheels are going to come off of this guy. Mark, I'm telling you, the wheels are going to come off. And thank God for Joe Biden, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and another Ryan question. Uh, Steve Baus wants to know now that the left is attacking Ryan because of some of his shared beliefs with Ayn Rand, what are your views on Atlas Shrugged in five hours or less? Um, sorry, I got a little itch in my ear here. There are two questions really here. I'll answer the question that was asked and then I'll get to the deeper issue. What I think about Atlas Shrugged is, I read it last year. Somebody said to me when I first started Eject, Eject, Eject back in 2003, I think it might have been January or February of 2003, somebody said, well, Bill, you're obviously uh, an objectivist. Uh, how, how long have you been reading Ayn Rand? I said, I've never read Ayn Rand. And then people said, well, you sound just like her. And then I purposely didn't read Ayn Rand for damn near 10 years because I don't want to be derivative. But, uh, I don't know nine months ago, maybe a year ago almost. I went out to Arizona and spent a couple of days uh, relaxing and I took the book with me and I thought I'd get through a couple chapters, read the whole thing in a couple of days. So the question is a two-part question. What do I think of Atlas Shrugged and then what do I think of Ayn Rand? Atlas Shrugged as a novel is a superb plot. It's a really excellent plot. It's a great kind of a suspense, techno-thriller kind of a noir kind of, th as a plot, it is fantastic. Um, but as a book, it's virtually impenetrable. So again, I'll get to Ayn Rand's philosophy in a minute. Speaking as a writer now, Ayn Rand apparently said that she would not change a comma in Atlas Shrugged. Uh, I would say if somebody decided to cut two-thirds out of that book or three-quarters out of it, it would be an infinitely better book because what she's getting at in Atlas Shrugged is brilliant. But there are, you know, folks, you just can't have, and I'm not exaggerating here, you just can't have 30 pages of a soliloquy. You just can't have a 30-page soliloquy. You just can't. A 30-page soliloquy w when, um, when John Galt is giving his radio a 30 page, just, that's just not good writing, I'm sorry. Which is a crying shame, this is why I'm dealing with the book before I deal with her philosophy. It's a crying shame because you could, with a good editor, make a fantastic book and a great movie out of that. But um, it's, just, it's just really hard to read. And, and my personal experience with reading Atlas Shrugged was this, I would, get into the politics. I get into the business stuff and all the stuff with um, Reardon and all of the striving and the business stuff. I thought, this is awesome. And then you just get into hours and hours of stuff. And I'm just about to put the book down, but you know what kept getting the hook in me that kept me going until I finished the book? When Ayn Rand is talking about the government types, when she's talking about the, the swine that that live to redistribute other people's wealth, 
Her ear for the way they think and speak is so perfect that it constantly just pulled me right back into it. Just immediately, said, oh, oh, we're dealing with the government takeover of business. I can't put this down. It originally read like science fiction. Many people say now is that it's not, now it's just starting to look like an instruction manual. So let's move from Atlas Shrug, which I think has monumental flaws in terms of how a brilliant story, brilliant, brilliant plot is constructed. Let's get down to our philosophy. A lot of people dismiss Ayn Rand because of the turgid writing style of Atlas Shrugs and say the book is just crap and therefore she's just a, a hack. There's a lot to criticize about the book, but in terms of her understanding of the morality of wealth creation and her unabashed championing championing of things like um, you know uh, self-interest and the results of self-interest, I think it is philosophically astonishingly powerful stuff. I don't know enough, it's usually good when you don't know anything to come out and, and admit it. I don't know enough about the nuances of actual objectivism to be able to say how much of this is slander, certainly some of it is, but the criticisms that are leveled against objectivism are the kinds of things that basically say that altruism is, is destructive and has to be eliminated. Again, if I'm in phrasing this incorrectly, stepping on toes, my apologies. I'll just tell you this is what I hear often. Um, altruism is demonized by, by Rand, but I don't think that's necessarily needs to be the case. I think what needs to be demonized is coerced altruism, which really isn't altruism. Uh, I know I get, off the, I get off the reservation with some objectivists on this. I'll give you an example. Um, we did a trifecta on this not long ago. A couple weeks, a couple months ago, there was a woman runner. She was a college track and field person, and she just won a previous race, and she was in some long, you know, race, and uh, she wasn't doing well. She was coming in like 15th out of a field of 18 or something, and she's walking next to somebody and uh, running next to somebody rather, and the, the the runner from another team goes down, just collapses, and she stopped and picked her up and helped her cross the finish line and, and made sure that she finished ahead of her. And apparently, a conservative talk show host and callers calling in basically said, this is, this is the result of socialism and, and this is the result of Obama's America where, where we all are responsible for everybody else and nobody is, you know, that woman had an obligation and, or, you know, to, to cross the finish line first and, and helping the other person is not her problem and altruism, blah, 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 blah. And it's just insanity is what that is. That's madness. And it makes us sound like lunatics and cranks. Because what would have been socialism and madness would have been if she was required to pick that person up, if she had been required to give up her position in order to help that person. And you could also say that if it had been a relay race, she would have no right to give up her other team member's chance at any kind of a finish in order for her own personal desires. But that wasn't the case. Isn't the entire essence of what we believe, the idea of free will and freedom to choose and live your life the way you want to? This woman was a competitor. She made a decision to help that person up across the finish line. She wasn't required to. She didn't have to. Now, now we get into the area that I'm often accused of misunderstanding, and I'll own up to that. Maybe I don't misunderstand it. But there are certainly, what is true is there are certainly objectivists out there who say things like, any kind of assistance to other people, any kind of altruism is morally wrong because of the reasons that Ayn Rand, I, I, Ayn, Rand, Ayn Rand suggests. This is where we have to parse this very carefully. A society built on enlightened self-interest is a happy, successful, wonderful place to live. It's Disneyland. A society predicated on the requirements for people to help other people is the gulag and it's the death camp, and, and I've been saying this my whole life. But isn't the difference really the difference between coercion and free will isn't the isn't coerced sympathy, coerced assistance, coerced charity. Isn't that not charity at all? And is that not altruism at all? Isn't that just coercion? Period. I don't want to be coerced to do things. If I don't want to help people, that's my business. I should have a right to do whatever I want to. And if I want to, I don't. And I don't consider it selfish. I wouldn't consider it selfish of that woman to run past that woman. I'd have no problem whatsoever with a runner who has a runner go down next to them 
and they choose to continue to run the race. I have no problem with them. That person's not morally weak. There's no obligation. I don't feel there's an obligation for her to pick that person up. But we had many people calling in furious that she did. And when you get to the point where human compassion becomes an evil in itself, this is where I get off the boat. Compassion cannot be required or coerced because then it's not compassion. But isn't it true that conservatives are far more um, charitable than liberals? And they say charitable because no one's forcing them. Isn't the whole problem with liberalism and socialism the idea that you get this unearned moral superiority by people who aren't paying taxes anyway saying, we should help the poor by stealing other people's money at gunpoint? That's charity? That's, that's advanced morality? No, it's, it's, it's robbery. It's thievery. Ayn Rand said that the most evil person in the history of the world, the, the one myth that had to be destroyed was Robin Hood. And I thought that was a profoundly good point, a profoundly good point, that the idea of robbing from the rich and giving to the poor, this guy was a hero, Lot, lots of great stuff. We could do a whole thing on, on Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged, but the left is attacking Ryan because of Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand is demonized. She's fairly easy to demonize. She's very severe looking and comes off very severe and got that kind of Dr. Strange left thing going. But Ryan... I think it's a difference between Ryan and Romney. Ryan understands these conservative principles in his core, and Ryan has the vocabulary, the experience, and the intellect to argue them and champion them. My main problem with Mitt Romney is there's a guy who's made hundreds of millions of dollars, and he seems to be ashamed of it. This is the champion of our of our conservative party, but Mitt Mitt made a conservative, bold choice with Ryan, so I'm liking Mitt a lot better. Um, by the way, you know, uh, one of the things I talked to Yaron about yesterday, because he's, he's the, 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 the president of the Ayn Rand Institute, he was saying that even Republicans don't really understand the free market, don't like the free market. They're, they're, they're for smaller government, but they're still for big government, and that's true. And I realized that what really happens is and this is why this is why the Republicans are this is why we're constantly in trouble. This might be worth thinking about. The reason we're in trouble is because we're pro business and we're pro small government. But the problem is is that anybody who goes into politics is automatically a government person because they went into politics. Romney was a businessman and all of the small business conservatives out there are in business. Romney was a businessman, but something made Mitt Romney go into politics and that something is that little bit of I don't know what that defective gene is that makes you want to go into government and, and so on. But Romney did not go into government in order to build down government. I think Paul Ryan might have. And frankly, I'll close this whole Ryan thing by saying what I've said before and what I genuinely believe I had this thought again today. I think that somebody asked one of the questions that's downstream and I'll, I'll just answer it now. Uh, somebody said, Bill, do you have any political ambition? No. I wouldn't mind being the president simply because I'd like to be commander in chief. I think that'd be awesome. But um, no, I don't have any desire to be a congressman, a senator, sit there and listen to gas bags talking all day. I can't imagine a worse way to spend my day. But that's because I don't have any desire to enforce my will over people. And I am 100% convinced that the best thing you could do to this country is to treat the 535 members of the American population that live in an actual democracy. That's 435 House members and 100 senators best thing you could do for this country would be to make politics function the same way as jury duty, where you simply go to the pool of eligible voters, legal citizens, I know these two things aren't the same anymore, but they used to be, and um, you get a notice in the mail. You are now chosen as a representative from your district and starting in November or January, you have to go to Washington for two years and represent the people of your district. That would mean that people would say, I can't do this. I can't do jury duty. I, I, I can't, I've got a business to run. I've got a life. I can't go. I can't be gone for a month. How can I be gone for a month? You out of your mind? I can't do that. That's what, that's what it would mean. It would mean you'd get people who had no desire to be in politics. That's exactly what we need. We need people with no desire to be in politics. And you could say, well, you might get all kinds of weirdos and, and degenerates, to which I'd say you would not get a lower percentage of weirdos and degenerates than the weirdos and degenerates we have in there now. Um, see you, Max. You're a good lad. Um, 
I think I, I really do think that the politics should be denied to people who want to become politicians. These are the people that get us into trouble, right? These are the people that do nothing but think, well, I'm a legislator. I have to make new laws. Why? It's what we do. Well, maybe we don't need any new laws. Well, I'll find something. I think I think representation ought to be by um, just randomly assigned by a computer and. Uh, and you get the call that you're going to be the senator from the great state of Rhode Island, and it's life ruining. You have to give up your business and go to Washington and deal with these lunatics and nutcases for six years. Where's my business going to be when I come back? Those kind of people we could use. So let's move on. Mm. I'm going to make short work of this. Uh, Sleepy Joe Kilbasa asked me, what are your thoughts on the Todd Aiken situation? Do you think he should have stepped down, and do you think he can still win it? Jess Bradshaw says, I'll deal with that in a minute, um, one by one. Look, is it fair that Aiken should be under this kind of criticism when the lion of the Senate on the Democratic side, Ted Kennedy, is known to have basically, if not raped, then, then fondled aggressively against their will? Any number of women, is there fair? Of course it's not fair. Of course it's not fair. But these are the cards. When when you're dealing when you're dealing with an opposition that's entire path to victory is predicated on a narrative that is a package of lies, you cannot provide them with any evidence whatsoever that there's any truth to this narrative. Now, I don't really want to get too much into details because I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but we did have three or four questions about it. Okay. He asked me a few minutes, I, I answered a few minutes ago a question about whether I would run for office. If I ran for office and this had happened to me, I would have withdrawn. The fact that he doesn't withdraw indicates to me he's not fit for office because he doesn't put the interests of the, con of the country and the party above his ego. So actually, my main problem with Aiken is not what he said, although what he said was reprehensible and stupid. My main problem with Aiken is it's yet another guy who's ready to trash the entire party and not just the party because if his if his loss if he loses and it costs us control of the Senate that could mean the difference between Obamacare he could literally could cost us the country but his damn ego is so enormous that he's decided he's just gonna ride this thing out this is exactly you can't find a better example of the miserable kinds of people that become politicians so there's the paradox right he said something stupid uh, Jess Bradshaw says Aiken was given information he thought was true. He repeated it. How does it make him unelectable? There's a strong case to be made there. But at the same time, honestly, honestly, are you really, are you really expecting me to believe that a fully grown man who wants to be a representative for 50% of the population, which is female, actually believes that there's some magical thing that happens to a woman during rape that prevents pregnancy? Is that really excusable ignorance today? I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I'd like to see him go. And I understand that it's not fair. But you know what? It's supposed to be not fair. It's harder to be people of integrity. It's harder to be people with character than it is to be people with no character. And if you have a party, presumably, that has character, it makes it harder. You know, th this is something we see all the time. It, um, it's a really great point. And the point is, Democrats are constantly accusing Republicans of being hypocrites. And the reason that we're hypocrites is because we have standards that we fail to live up to. No one ever accuses them of being hypocrites. They can't be hypocrites. They have no standards. Bill Clinton is a, is a immoral, womanizing cad. Is he a hypocrite? No. He's, everybody knew that about Bill Clinton. Taken as red. We have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. Isn't this the entire idea? of conservatism and character and honor isn't this essentially isn't this essentially the precepts of christianity isn't it really a very subtle but very primary idea of christianity is not that because people are christians they get the get out of jail free card on the contrary because they're christians they are aware of their human failings and their failure is more profound for the fact that they understand the stakes they're still forgiven but isn't that really the essence of, of living your life to a higher standard? So I, 
I'm in favor of living our life to a higher standard. I think that what he said was stupid enough to make him unfit for office. Is it fair? No, I don't think it's fair. But, you know, you have to, there comes a point where you, where you have to start asking yourself, what, what is accommodation to the real world? so that you're not living in a fantasy land and that you're not living in, a, in, in this little world in your head versus what point do you accommodate, accommodate the real world so much you become a cynic and you lose your principles. We're getting close to the boundary here for this on, on this. I wouldn't throw an innocent person under the bus. I wouldn't say, well, he, you know, if it was a genuine misstatement or something like that, I'd, I'd, I'd say fight it. But I don't think we have the luxury of, of, of of this kind of thing. It looks awful. And Mitt Romney, to his credit, whether he believes it or not, I suspect he does believe it, but even if not, from a tactical point of view, has come out and categorically denied it. Don't you notice that these guys never deny this? No one categorically denied when when um, Joe Biden said, we're, they're all gonna, you're gonna put you all back in chains. Barack Obama said, well, blah, 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 blah. didn't deny it. Of course not, they're never wrong. Denying it and standing up for your principles and holding people accountable is something that people notice. Remember when Trent Lott made a couple of off-cover comments? He was uh, Senate Majority Leader. He's not Senate Majority Leader the next week because Republicans forced him out of office. We're better people than they are. And that means it's harder than them. It's easy to be one of those folks. I don't want to talk about Aiken anymore. Uh, Bo Monday wants to know, if did, did it shoot our effort in the face? Um, I don't know how this is going to play out. I think it'll probably blow over. I don't want it to blow over. I want to be on the right side of this. I want to be people. And, and Romney, look, Romney and the RNC and all of the punditry, myself included, have done everything we can. We say the guy needs to step down. Now, if he doesn't step down, he's just, he's just, he's got that, that kind of pit bull sort of, and I don't mean pit bull in a determined way. I mean, just that pit bull sort of look like, yeah. We don't need these kind of headaches, especially now. Let's move on. Um, this is an interesting question um, from Richard Broad. Broad, sorry, Richard. I'm a big believer in the scientific method, but as of late, it seems real science has been replaced by hype and fear mongering for political purpose. Do you see the same thing? I categorically do. Um, I think that science has become politicized to a degree that it's never been politicized before. And what's really unusual is recently the scientists are proud of this. There's a magazine called New Scientist Magazine and the whole thing is, um, is dedicated to politically conscious science. Wow. I have a strong science background. I started teaching astronomy when I was 13 years old. I've worked in geochronology labs. I've been an astronomy um, lab assistant. I, 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 get, I get how science works pretty well. And for a long time, I was a real sort of, you know, raging atheist and religion is evil and all of that idiocy that I used to believe. And I used to be prone to say things like, um, well, I believe in science. That is an unbelievably stupid thing to say. Uh, among many stupid things I used to say and think, because I didn't think about them, by the way. I, I, I think I need to cut myself that break. I just never really thought about these things. I just parroted what other people were saying, and I never gave it any deep thought. And once I started giving it deep thought, I changed my mind. So let's talk about, about science and science's place in our society. We live in an extremely technological society that becomes more technological daily. And the level of scientific knowledge among the general population in general and the political class in particular is shockingly poor. Shockingly poor. And this is a critical problem that we face and this problem is not going to be getting better, it's going to be getting worse. So people talk about, and, and, and Obama uh, during the campaign speech says, restoring science to its rightful place. I hear that and I listen to these people, and I used to be one of these people, and what they mean when they say restoring science to its, to its rightful place, they mean as a golden calf on, upon a pedestal that we shall all worship. Because 
the great misunderstanding about science, and this is why these this is why these um, these atheists, these radical atheists, who who like to sound so intelligent. I don't believe in this imaginary friend in the sky and the flying spaghetti monster. All these guys are trying to show you how how deep thinking they are, how deep thinking they are. You say, well, what do you believe? It's like I believe in science. So science is your religion. No, science is. Yeah, First of all, it is their religion. But let's get to the to what science is. These deep thinkers that say, I believe in science, kind of like saying I believe in a in a scalpel or I believe in a chainsaw. I believe in a in a in a hammer. They think that humanism is science, but it's not. Humanism is a philosophy. You cannot believe in science because science isn't a philosophy. Science is very simple. Science, there is no political there is no political component to science. Most people don't even know what science is. Some people think science is a big warehouse with a bunch of catalog stuff in it. Science is a way of thinking about things. It is a method to think about things. It is a profoundly powerful method to do certain types of things very well. And all of the advances, like this conversation we're having right now, is a result of applying a way of thinking to the world. Science has tremendous power. And Carl Sagan, who I used to read religiously, if you'll pardon the expression, and who I've come to disagree with as I've grown older and wiser in some issues, nevertheless points out that if you've got um, a person who's dying of plague, you can either pray over him or you can get him antibiotics and see which one turns out the best. And when he talks about science that way, he's 100% correct. But that's not where they leave it. They say, I believe in science. Science should be restored to its rightful place. And what they're really saying is science should be restored as a philosophy, but science is not a philosophy. Science is a way of thinking about things. And science is designed not to answer philosophical questions, not designed to answer questions about how we get along together and how we live. Science is designed for a very specific purpose. That's why it's a scalpel or a, a chainsaw or a hammer. It's a tool. And you can't perform brain surgery with a chainsaw or a hammer. Well, you can, but the effects are not quite as, as, as uh, satisfactory as they would be if you use a scalpel. Likewise, trying to chop down a tree with a scalpel will take a long time. Certain tools are used for certain purposes, other tools used for other purposes. Not so hard to figure out. So what is the tool that science is designed for? Science is designed primarily to interrogate nature and to find out what is happening in the natural world. Science cannot really be applied to many kinds of human problems, but if you want to interrogate the, the laws of nature, science is the way to go. Science, science was, is simply this. It's a way to, to isolate variables out in the world and to pull as much as is humanly possible human um, blinders of preconceptions out of the way. So the essence of science is I observe a phenomenon. I, I take some, some notes, I, I, I record the details, and so I have some fair idea of what I'm actually watching. Then I come up with a hypothesis, an explanation, a potential explanation that might explain what I'm seeing. This is a, it's a mental creation, it's a theory. It's not even a theory yet, it's really a hypothesis. And then with my hypothesis, I will then think about what can I do as a test of my hypothesis. So what specific thing can I do so that if, if the experiment goes one way, it lends credence to what I believe, and if it goes the other way, it dismisses what I believe. Because that's really what you're trying to do. Most people think you're trying to prove a theory, but actually disproving a theory is very useful in science. So you construct an experiment. And one of the qualities of the experiment is that if you're pinging nature, this should be true anywhere in the world. It should be true in uh, China, should be true in India, should be true 100 years ago, 2,000 years from now. Certain things should remain the same. So we construct experiments and we refine experiments. Then we come at it from different ways. And if it turns out this is showing us something, let's try something else. And if that shows us the same kind of thing, chances on are we're on the right track. And if it comes back mathematically, if the values come back in prediction, not just come back, but if they come back in the right measure and the right size, then you've got a, a, a strong indication that you've, that you've um, got something. 
So that's what science does. And you cannot turn that into a philosophy because it's not a philosophy. It's a way to find out things like the speed of light and, and uh, how old a tree is and, and any number of other things. So when you talk about science being replaced by hype and fear-mongering, Richard, um, for a political purpose, because science has such a strong predictive quality, because science is so powerful and produces such powerful results, astonishingly powerful results, dying children are just saved with a shot. And we can talk to each other across time and space. Some of you are watching this live all around the country, conceivably all around the world. Some of you will be watching this on YouTube days, weeks, months, shall we say centuries and millennia after it's recorded because this is needless to say timeless. It's a miracle. And that miracle is produced by this method of thinking about things, of isolating things and, and getting variables locked down and building theories upon theories and changing them and modifying all that stuff. But that's not a philosophy. But the problem is, is that scientists and certainly politicians want to steal the credibility of science, because science has profound credibility when confined to scientific circles. And politicians want to steal the credibility of science and apply it to politics and use that credibility as a lever to get people to do things that they want them to do even though the science doesn't apply. Global warming is the classic example, but a much more accessible example is this. You often see, especially liberals, um, with uh, like these demotivational posters and stuff of Einstein. And Einstein apparently famous, so you'll see a picture of Einstein with the, the hair and the mustache and looking very brilliant, because he's simply the best mind that ever lived. There's no question he's the brightest guy that ever lived. Relativity, the, the secrets of the universe at the speed of light on the far side of the universe were determined by a young man in a patent office in Bern, Switzerland with time on his hands. It's, it's, it's simply the greatest human intellectual achievement of all time of all time. But you will see people with a picture of Einstein and it will say, you cannot simultaneously prepare for and prevent war. Albert Einstein. Oh, well, Einstein said it, so it must be true. Why do we take Albert Einstein's opinion on politics? What does Albert Einstein know about politics? What an absurd thing to say. If that doesn't, if that's not clear enough for you, do we take Albert Einstein's opinion on, on handicapping sports scores? Do we ask Albert Einstein who's going to win the World Series? Do we ask Albert Einstein for fashion tips? Do we ask him for hairstyling cues? Do we ask Albert Einstein what the, what the hottest songs are? Do we ask Albert Einstein about any of these things? Of course not. Why? Because Albert Einstein doesn't know anything about those things. That's why. This is the entire problem with elitism. It's the idea of misplaced credibility. You're credible in one area, so therefore you're credible in another nonsense. Matter of fact, matter of fact, the more brilliant you get when you become a historically brilliant guy like Einstein or, or, or you know, any of these guys, somebody mentioned Tesla, all these guys, it's because their knowledge is so profoundly deep in one area that they've made a historical name for themselves, but that depth limits the width, right? So they're very, very good in very, 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 very small, narrow little fields. Albert Einstein doesn't know anything about politics. You want to ask people whether or not they should prepare for war? Why don't you ask warriors? I'd be interested in what Ulysses Grant had to say about that, or George Patton, or Eisenhower. Those guys might have a profound insight into whether arming prevents or causes wars. But Albert Einstein, no. So this is the kind of thing that people do. They try to take the credibility of science, the predictive credibility and the power of science, and they try to apply it to politics. And that's what's happening today, and that's why it has to be stopped. Because when a scientist, a, a scientist says, the science is settled on global warming, it shouldn't be discussed anymore. You know, there's a guy who doesn't, know, understand, doesn't understand anything about science. The entire idea of science is that one person, one person with a theory and an experiment that, or a series of experiments that out, that simply locks out the prevailing theory, and his theory covers it, changes the world. One guy can do that. Relativity changed the foundational way we view things because the experimental evidence became so good over time that it became conventional wisdom because it was a better way to look at the universe than Newtonian physics. But that wasn't the standard knowledge. So the idea that the science is settled is absurd. One guy with a theory and the experimental evidence to back it up, especially evidence, ev experimental, repeatable experimental evidence that destroys the prevailing theory, 
that guy will change the world. So this science is settled consensus. It's the opposite of science. So don't let these people use that science bad on you. Scientists should be respected for people that make a scientific prediction within their own area of expertise. And you know you're in trouble when you have climate scientists talking about policy. They should never talk about policy. Once you hear a climate scientist talking about policy, that unholy alliance of these two things has already happened and it's time to disregard what they're saying because their sociology is taking over their science. I'd have a lot more confidence in global warming if the people that were the strongest proponents of it, when asked what should we do about this, should say, I have nothing to say about what we should do about it. I'm just, preventing, I'm just pre presenting dev uh, data on climate uh, change and temperature rises. These are my predictions for what the temperatures are going to be. Well, what do you think we ought to do? It's not my business to tell you what, we, we, what we're going to do. I'm not a politician. I don't know what we should do. I'm telling you that this is what we see in terms of the, the temperature change. That would be a lot more credible than um, uh, we're seeing temperature rising, so we need to shut down capitalism. That's what happens when you mix science and politics. Let's see here. I'll touch on this briefly. Um, Michael Baker wants to know, he says, this coming election is of world importance. This really is a moment of truth. What's my sense of the electorate at the moment? Does it feel or sound like 2010 again, or is the populace going to go down the France 2012 route? I think we're going to whip these Marxists out of their boots. I think we're going to win this thing gigantic, big, really big, really big. Historically, uh, no president's ever been elected when uh, the question, do you, well, that only goes back to Reagan, but do you feel better off than you were four years ago? That number has to be above 50 percent, otherwise you don't get reelected, and Obama's number is 40 percent. No one's ever been reelected when the um, unemployment level was above 7.5 percent. It's been 8.5 forever. Uh, any number of these historical kind of statistics are, are not looking good for him. Uh, historically, the race always breaks for the challenger, and Obama should be up by 7, 8, 10, 12 points by now. Carter was up that much over Reagan at this point. He's going to get his butt handed to him. They don't, they, don't have, they don't have any idea what's coming for them. These polls become tighter and tighter and tighter, and you realize that's because they keep oversampling more and more and more Democrats. They're sampling them at the 2008 rate, which is not the most recent snapshot of the electorate. The most recent snapshot was 2010. And, um, and 2010 was better than 2012. The trend is not going, the 2008 trend is what they're looking at, these, these liberal pollsters, but the 2010 trend went just the exact opposite direction and things have gotten worse since then. I think we're going to do much better. And the bellwether for me and all of this, you're talking about Ryan picking, talk about all this other stuff, but the only thing in this whole picture is I make a living trying to read tea leaves. The one thing that we should hold on to and that we should hang on to with a great deal of joy and confidence is Wisconsin. Wisconsin. The Democrats went all in on that. They put in a ton of money. They, 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 put, they bet the farm on it. And Walker won by seven points. In Wisconsin. Romney's up in Wisconsin. I mean, tell you, we're going to destroy them. We're going to destroy them. It's going to be a 47-state win, I think. I really do. I really genuinely do. Um, all the all the signs are, are, are pointing that way. And um, and this is before Romney starts spending his big money and before Romney gets a hold of him in the debates, and needless to say, Ryan and Biden in the debates. Obama's destroyed his personal likability with all of these negative answers. We're going to destroy them. We're going to destroy them. And I'm so proud to be a member of the Tea Party because when the rally stopped, I thought, ah, oh, is that it? I never really thought that was it, but I, I, I wondered. It's like, no, the, the rally stopped because... Unlike the left that has to be seen being virtuous and show everybody what big, you know, once a, once a year they go out and have their rally and they feel like they've done their good and that's the end of it. That's not what conservatives do. Conservatives are serious people. So conservatives went to Tea Party rallies for a year and a half, and then once everybody got in everybody else's email address, then they stopped going to rallies. You know why? Because there's no point in going to rallies anymore. Now what's important is getting out the vote, and I do two, three local Tea Party events a month. And I just go talk to groups of people, 30 people, 50, 100, 300, whoever have me. And I tell them the only thing they have to do is go out there and get people to vote. And uh, then when that happens, we're going to destroy them. Destroy them. Which leads me to Gabe Grantham's question, which is related. He says he read an article on American Thinker that posed a great question. And I'll just paraphrase here. Uh, will these guys be willing to do 
to win by by any means necessary? Do we think we'll see any kind of martial law or anything like that? No, I don't think that. Um, the only way that you can bring revolution to America is softly and slowly, which is why Barack Obama, when it's all said and done, will have been the best thing that happened to America. He upped the pace. He took what would have been, uh, you know, watching, you ever seen kudzu in the South? If you don't, look up K-U-D-Z-O, Google it when we're done, get some Google images on kudzu. Kudzu is a plant that was going to um, come to uh, America as a, uh, was a decorative plant. It was an indoor plant. You know, somebody brought brought it over from Japan, thought it looked nice. So then they let it outdoors or whatever, and then the seeds scatter, and now the entire southeast is covered by this leafy green plant that grows over houses, grows over parked cars, grows over all the existing trees. It's like somebody laid a green blanket over six states. You can drive down Interstate 10 for two hours at 70 miles an hour and see nothing but the same plant. It's kudzu. And so in order to take over America, socialize America, take away your freedoms, you have to do it slowly because America is a rebellious country full of people like you and me who are jealous of our freedoms. And the, if Barack Obama and the Democrats had taken eight years to do this, and if he'd been smart enough to basically govern from the middle until he got reelected, which should have been a shoe in and then pulled all the Marxism out, they're just, thank God they're incompetent. That's the main difference between Obama and Hitler. Hitler was competent. Um, there are other differences too before you have a heart attack. Uh, but um, it's really that. So he he cannot he cannot leave office. He has to leave office because if he doesn't, that's when people grab their muskets, right? That's when that's when he will be removed from office. I don't see him not leaving office. I don't see martial law. I don't see any of that stuff. I don't see that. Just it's just it's it's inconceivable to me. The American people wouldn't stand for it, and even the press might even pay attention if that actually happened. However, I won't put it past him to lawyer this thing up. This is why we have to win by five, six, seven points. We have to win by such a margin that it becomes pointless to fight. But he's hired fifty thousand lawyers or something for election day, so I assure you. I'll tell you one thing I will bet. I will bet you dimes to dollars that he will not concede that night. There will be reports of voter suppression in some county somewhere, and, and until we get the truth and until every vote is counted, until the American people, if we know that every single vote is counted, I think he'll probably lawyer it up if it's even half close. That's why I'm hoping it's a 10-point landslide. I hope it's over bef you know, by you know, 8 o'clock uh, Eastern time. But he's not going to go gratefully, uh, gracefully into the good night, and he is going to fight and argue. And as I said earlier, he's going to be the worst ex-president ever. He's going to be constantly, every week on TV, telling people that this giant recovery that happened the instant he was out of office would have happened anyway, and if only they'd waited another week, they would have, they would have had the election. So, you know, I don't care what he thinks. I, I personally want to see him the next day. I want to see that guy's concession speech more than I want just about anything in this world. So, and I think I'm going to see it, too. And by the way, uh, after the election, I'm going to take a little bit of time off, unless he wins, and then I'll make a little speech. So here's what's going to happen after the election. If Romney wins, I'll take a little break, and then we will have a small window of a 1,000 days at the most in order to get all of this stuff undone, or at least as much of it as we can. We will have to really put the pedal to the metal if Romney wins and stay on top of Romney and unbuild as much of this stuff as we can. I don't mean just hold the line. I mean, let's go on offense and deconstruct this stuff. If Obama wins, I'll be on the, I'll be on the internet that day, the next day, and the day after that. Because then, my friends, we're going to have to stop talking about um, what happens to prevent the catastrophe, and then we're going to have to switch the conversation to what are we going to do on the other side of the catastrophe. Because four more years of this, there will not be a U.S. economy as we understand it. So let's win. Um, I can answer this one quickly. Raul Herrera Gamundi wants to know, any advice for young writers interested in writing a screenplay? Yes. My advice is write the screenplay. I don't mean to be flip, but it's really just that simple. I'd written nine of them. I had one of them produced. The one I'm working on now, Aurora, is by far the best thing I've ever done, but if I tried to write that first, I would have totally messed it up because you learn how to do things by doing them. It's like any other skill. No one expects that you can walk in and fly a helicopter 
which is far harder than flying an airplane, by the way. Hovering a helicopter is like balancing on a beach ball that's floating in a pool. It's hard. And then all of a sudden, you can do it. Your muscle memory just, you finally learn it, you can do it, then it's automatic. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago on filmmaking, where the question was, any advice for filmmakers? Yes, don't come to Hollywood. Make movies locally. And when you learn how to do it and you have something showable under your belt, then think about coming out. Do not come to Hollywood to write a screenplay. That's insane. You will be one of billions of people. Yes, billions, probably trillions of actual people writing screenplays. The best way to learn how to write a screenplay is to write a screenplay. I can, however, give you two pieces of advice for those of you interested. And you can always back this up. It'll be on YouTube. Get a book called uh, Screenwriting. Um, I've forgotten his name. It's the definitive book on screenwriting. It's really excellent. Uh, I've forgotten his name. Maybe somebody will get it or search it. But anyway, screenwriting, it's superb. And then get another book called Making a Good Script Great, which you need to read after you read screenwriting because that's talking about rewriting. And script writing especially is the rewrite. It's all in the rewrite. The final thing I'll say on this, don't want to waste a lot of time on this because it's a fairly narrow question, but you will never, ever, ever write a great first draft, but you have to finish. The best advice I could give to screenwriters or any other kind of writers is this. If you find yourself going back to rewrite something before it's finished, you will never finish. Do not ever, 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 ever go backwards. Finish the script. And if you say, well, I don't know, it's a lot of stuff I want to change, change it later. You will get caught in a loop of just changing the first act, changing the first act. Once you start it, you have to, you have to, you have to cut your wrist with a knife, right? And then you have to cut the other wrist with a knife. Then you have to shake hands with yourself and make yourself a blood oath that says, once I start, um, once I start this process, I will not go backwards until it's finished. I won't rewrite a word until I am done. Because think of it this way. A screenplay or a novel or any other kind of story, the first draft, there's nothing there. You've got a jungle clearing, and you have to clear the jungle. You have to get the foundation of the plot and the characters on the ground. You can't tweak it. You can't finesse it until the end is there because you don't know what the end is going to be. You think you do, but you don't. I forget who said this, but somebody talking about right. I, it was Jim Lilacs said to me in an email. He said, um, you know, when you start chasing that rabbit, you know what hole it went down, but you don't know which hole it's going to come up. And that's exactly right. Once you start writing something, you got an idea. Oh, yeah, I'm going to. here's the beginning, here's the middle, and here's the end. Never works that way. You always go. You just learn. You just The story tells itself, and you end up completely different places. So my point is, the first draft is designed to give you a start, middle, and an end. And then you can fix things like character and dialogue and, and plot and all that other stuff. You can't do it until you finish the first draft. And I have an ironclad rule about this in terms of my personal uh, dealings with writers. Anyone who has finished one screenplay is a writer in my book. And until you have finished a screenplay or a short story or a novel, if you have not finished it and presented it to somebody else, you're not a writer. You're dabbling. You could be a writer. Maybe you'll be a great writer. But writers finish things, and then they show them other people, and other people read them. So if you think you're a writer, and you're telling everybody you're a writer, and you want to be a writer, you can listen to this writer who's got a major problem with writing, writer's block, not even writer's block, just I just don't like sitting down to write. I love the process once I get started. I hate starting the process. With that said, I have to finish things. And I've done, I guess I've done, I bet I've done 100 afterburners and firewalls, nine, uh, nine feature film screenplays, and a book. They're finished. They may be good, they may not be good, but they're finished. And a finished bad screenplay gets more respect from me than an unfinished great screenplay. You gotta do it, man. You gotta finish it. So that's my advice there, Raul. Um, Mark McConnell asked me about energy. You know what? I'd like to, uh, we're, we're at, uh, what are we? We got six minutes left to the 90 minutes, and I might go a little bit longer, but that's how long we've been recording. Um, uh, Mark, if you could re-ask that, that's one of the things I want to I wanna just spend a lot of time on. I've still got a whole page of things. You're not getting anything close to it. I'm sorry. Just give me a second to, um, to look at this. Okay. I'm going to take, uh, I've got four or five other great questions, and I'm sorry about not being able to, to take them, but I'm going to take this one. That's from Julian G., and it says, I got into a discussion the other day with a friend who's a self-described feminist Democrat, 
And we got into a discussion about the appeal to compassion, a brilliant tactic that the left uses to make economic policies that spend us into debt an emotional issue and not a facts and figures issue versus the greater good and so on. I was wondering what your thoughts are on this idea and how you think one can talk about this without coming off as a heartless bastard, as I'm sure that's how she now sees me. It's a superb question. They're all superb questions. First of all, let's look at Paul Ryan again briefly. I don't want to spend a lot more time on Ryan, but let's look at him briefly. When Ryan talks about policy, he's demonized by the left as being a uh, cold-hearted guy, that, that famous commercial, who wants to push grandma off a cliff in her wheelchair. And that's how you can demonize an opponent so long as the opponent doesn't have a say in it. But put aside any strategy or tactics or, or plan or counter story or anything. Ryan, Ryan talks about these things competently, calmly, and he is so obviously not an angry, mean-spirited guy that it simply doesn't stick. This is why we're going to destroy these people. When people actually get to listen to Ryan and the Ryan plan and Romney and, and all these things, they're going to realize that we're not the demons that they, they made us out to be. The problem with conservatives is because we think of these things rationally and logically, because our identities are wrapped up in things like our businesses or our, our achievements, our families, our success, our church lives, our, our personal lives, you know, maybe we're a little league coach, because we have a life, we don't have to have our identity soaked up in politics. So we tend to think of things like these sort of appeals to emotion as being cheap and, and unworthy, but they're not. They're cheap and unworthy when they're applied to further a lie, like this whole socialism thing and this whole unending bottomless bag of candy that you can eat forever and never get fat or lose your teeth or get diabetes. When you use emotion and passion to lie, then it is cheap and tawdry and below us. But if you don't use emotion and passion to advance the truth, you are doing the truth a disservice. You're not doing the truth the best job you can do for the truth. One of the comments I seem to get most from people is, I really like your passion because it's pretty clear, I guess, after, after all this time that when I, when I get into something, I believe this stuff. I don't, I don't just come up with this stuff, read it and say, oh, that seems to make sense and, and sell it. I understand it and I believe it. And I, when I say I believe it, I don't just mean I, I find it to be true. I believe it in the way I believe I have a faith in it. I have a religious faith in it, and my faith is predicated on me having tested it against history and logic and facts. But if I, if I give something the kind of fire assay where I really, really break it down and melt it down into component parts and I'm utterly convinced that this is as close to the truth as I can determine it to be, then I believe it. And when I believe it, I care about it. And when I care about it, it shows because I get excited about things. And when people, when people lie about things that I believe in, I get angry. And when people defend them with integrity and character and with skill, I become enormously passionate and, 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 um, and I become a big cheerleader for that, for that thing or that idea. So this idea that um, emotion, an appeal to emotion is automatically bad, I don't think is right. I, I do understand exactly what you're saying. It's a, it's a very powerful weapon and the left uses it effectively. So what, what are we really talking about here? What we're really talking about is entitlement programs that, are not, that have already, without question, have already bankrupted the most wealthy nation in the history of the world, stolen all our money, stolen our kids' money, and stolen our grandkids' money. Against this catastrophic failure and ruin, we have the president point to an old lady up in the, up in the upper booth there during the State of the Union speech. She's up in the balcony. and. He talks about how this woman was, was uh, being thrown out of her house and, and she didn't have enough money and, and she was eating cat food and, and she really thought about taking her own life and along comes this policy and, and now she's up there happy and smiling and that person up there who's happy and smiling has a reality that $15 trillion doesn't have. That's the genius. That's why it works. So people will say, oh, well, 
I don't want that lady to have anything bad to her. We don't talk about other ways she could have been helped. We don't talk about all of the people that are going to starve and be miserable because of the $15 trillion that we spent in order to get this lady where she needs to be. We don't talk about any of that. We just isolate this little emotional reaction. People go, oh, he's nice. The president seems very nice. He's got a nice smile. Let's vote for him. If you're going to run up against that kind of obligation, uh, sorry, opposition, if we lived in a Republic of Angels where policy would be debated by two people of integrity using the facts and logic and history, we'd live in a far better place. I've said many, many, many times, I say it every time the subject comes up, if somebody gives me a convincing argument that goes against what I believe and they can back that up with facts, logic, and history and it can be tested, then I will change my mind. I change my mind to get here. And if I get a convincing argument, I will change my mind again. But as I get into the fight, I realize there are no convincing arguments on the left. When, when, when people who criticize my work criticize it by saying that I said things that I never, not only didn't say, but the opposite of what I said. When I do a, a, an essay like Tribes, which is about decisions and choices, it is an anti-racist screed. And when people say you're racist, I realize they cannot defeat the arguments of what I was saying on the basis of what I said. So they have to construct an argument that not only did I not say, but was the opposite of what I said, and then defeat that straw man argument. Then I know they don't have anything. They got nothing. It kind of reminds me of the, the days, early days in the Tea Party movement uh, when you would hear this, uh, there was like a liberal uh, progressive kind of a campaign to infiltrate Tea Party events and bring racist signs. We're going to infiltrate, we're liberals, we're going to infiltrate the, the racist Tea Party and bring racist signs so everybody can see how racist it is. And people said, Ooh, but what they didn't say was, there is your evidence that the Tea Party isn't racist because you have to manufacture evidence that you cannot find otherwise. And the fact that the evidence is not there is a case of absence of evidence. In that case is evidence of absence. Of course, they're not racist. That's why they can't find the signs. That's why they have to make the signs. See what I'm saying here? It's, it's just hard to do it this way. But Passion and, and emotion work both ways, and passion and emotion harness truth. The truth are far more powerful than passion and emotion harnessed to a lie. Harnessed to a lie. Um, I've said this before, it bears repeating. I, I did an event, a Tea Party event, in Arizona last year, and Tammy Bruce was there, and I'd never spoken to her before, and she's a former radical feminist lesbian progressive who saw the light and decided to become a champion of conservatism. And she said to me, we we're just walking back to our hotel rooms, and she said, um, have you ever realized how easy it is to flip these people? I said, yeah, I have. She says, I'll go to a college and I've had people who've had five years of, four years of college indoctrination, 20 years of indoctrination in high school and their parents were liberal, and I'll talk to them for 10, 15 minutes and they become conservatives. So that's really true, isn't it? She says, yeah, they never heard the other side. They, 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 everything they've heard has been um, vitriol and personal attacks. They've never heard that. They've never heard it. Once they hear it, they change. And I said, that's right. And then Tammy said something I never forgot. It's an old, old, old uh, sort of an adage, but I never really gave it the, the power that it deserves. Tammy said, that's because the truth is so powerful because even the tiniest light will light a big room. Even a candle in the Super Bowl, in, a, in, in the Superdome, will light the whole Superdome, dimly, but it'll do it. It's because darkness has no power. You can't pump darkness into a room. You can only have darkness when there is no light. That's why the conservative voice has to be silenced at every opportunity, because even the smallest amount of light lights the room. Darkness has no power. So if you got the truth on your side, if you're holding the candle, right, why not pour a little kerosene on the candle, right? Why not blow some oxygen, some kerosene on the candle? Because the candle is the truth, and the truth deserves our passion and our emotion. And passion and emotion in service to the truth, backed up by facts and backed up by reason, is an insurmountable obstacle to these people. It's an unbeatable combination. That's try, tr try, to, try to be what I do. So that's pretty much it. And uh, we're now at a minute, oh, sorry, an hour 35. We're five minutes over, and there's one more question. And uh, I'm going to answer this because it's super short. And uh, I've always tried to make these things more about personal issues than political issues. So Carlton Hines asks, uh, are you married? And if not, why not? I'm not married. 
I've never been married. I'm 53. It's getting a little ripe to not have been married. Uh, I get asked that question quite a lot. I've come close once. Uh, once. Um, but uh, no, I never got married. And I never got married because uh, my parents got divorced when I was 12 or 13. And I just decided, I never decided that I wasn't going to get married. Never, ever. Uh, but I, um, I decided if I was going to get married, I wanted to do it once. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do it a bunch. I, I will say this: a lot of people really mock and scorn people who've been married, you know, four, five, six times, that kind of thing. They're just filled with disdain towards them. I've always felt very sympathetic to those people. I, I think there's something actually kind of noble about it. You know, you could, you could. Um, <laughs> Joanne Luffin says, I was talking about why I'm not married. She says that explains the car. Yeah, uh, it's not a married guy's car. Um, th there's something about somebody who's been married five, six times that is very, I don't know, I find it, I find it endearing that they're looking and they want to do the right thing. They don't want to just, you know, shack up. They're looking. They're trying to, they're trying to make the right decision. Maybe they're not giving the person enough time. Maybe they've got some, some you know, cohabitability issues. Uh, you know, the, the real answer to your question, though, Carlton, and something you guys probably may know or may not know, but the fact of the matter is, up until I was 40, I was purely feral. I mean, completely feral. Uh, I'm still kind of got some lifelong bachelor habits that need to be beaten out of me. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really find myself until I was 40, 41, 42, something like that. I spent most of my life, I was, I was a pretty happy kid. But between 17 and, golly, 35, I guess, I was just a disaster. I had the lowest self-esteem of any human being on the face of this earth. I mean, really, really, really. And so I would go around and try to convince people of how smart I am. And by the way, this kind of ties into why I have such contempt for so many of these people on the left, because I was one of those people, and I saw what they're doing, and I know why they're doing it. So I would go around telling everybody how smart I am, you know, and talking about how bright I am and my big brain and all, and think about this and that and so on and so forth and so on. I was just filling up this giant black hole of, of self-doubt. You know you're dealing with somebody who's not on the ball, who doesn't think about things when they go around telling you how smart they are because once you begin to realize how little you know, once you open your mind to the fact that you begin to get some dim appreciation for how little you know, that's the beginning of real wisdom and knowledge. Um, so you know, there's something weird about uh, late bloomers, and that is they are seasoned. And, and having spent 30, you know, 20, 25 years out in the wilderness getting the living daylights beaten out of me by life, uh, it either kills you or makes you stronger. I often uh, talk to other people who've, who've had, you know, like really rough years, and I mean like when I say rough years, I mean like rough decades. Uh, I, I often say to them, especially when they're really down and, and just beaten up and think there's no way outside of it. I said, uh, you know how they make samurai swords? You know, you know the procedure for making a samurai sword? This incredibly hard and yet incredibly flexible steel. Turns out what they do is, first of all, they get the best steel they can, and then they bash it out flat and long into the, something that looks kind of like a sword, get it red hot, bash it out flat, and then they fold it over on itself, then they bash it, bash it, bash it out, and then tsh, into ice cold water. And then the steel reacts. And then they take that out of the cold, cold water and stick it right back into the furnace, and they get it hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, get it red hot, Then they bring it back out to the anvil, and they smash the living daylights out of it again and again and again, and every time they smash the daylights out of it, heat, violence, fold, cool down, heat, violence, fold, cool down. It is a traumatic, vicious, terrible things to do to a piece of metal. And every time they do it, they fold it over again. And my understanding is, is that a samurai sword, if you section it and look at it, it's got 17 different folds. It's been folded and folded and hammered and folded and hammered. So the first one's hammered and folded. Now you've got two pieces. Those are hammered and folded. Now you've got four layers and hammered and folded and you got 16 and so on. They did it 17 times. So what you get is you get a, a, a steel that is not a um, monolithic piece of metal. It's a, it's, it's, it, that's what gives it the flexibility. And I, I use that example, needless to say, for those of you who are uh, quick on the uptake, to say that 
somebody who who has been through a great deal of of emotional hardship and financial hardship and you know anonymity and all these things that are painful to guys with my kind of temperament and to live with the fact that up until 2002 when I wrote eject started writing eject 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 I would I came to realize I was a guy with a great future behind him a guy I thought I'd missed the train and all of that despair makes you stronger you either you either end up doing heroin under a bridge or you decide you want to live and then you become stronger uh, so I don't know if I'm marriage material I, I guess I'm more marriage material than I used to be uh, you know we get better as we get older some of us do I'm, I'll say this last thing about being a late, a late bloomer being a late bloomer is really the way to live because what it means is you spend your life preparing for your for the second half of your life and that means that even at 53 I absolutely believe that my best days are ahead of me I, I, I have so many things that I've spent my entire life preparing for that just now I'm getting able to do and I've always felt that there are two people who who I have enormous empathy for one of them is the high school homecoming queen and the other one is the high school football hero because it has got to be the most appallingly awful way to go through life to realize that your life peaked when you were 17 years old and that everything after that is downhill I cannot imagine what that must be like that must be a special kind of hell so the nice thing about being a late bloomer is life just gets better and better and better and you you make your investment early you make an investment early now I just saw a comment there says go to church bill you find a good woman uh, I have been recently I've been actually dating an honest to God movie star that's all I can say about it right now it's a she by the way and um, We'll let this go a little bit further, and uh, maybe I can make that information public someday. But it's a it's a it's a person who I like very much, very much. Uh, been through some rough times like me. Somebody asked me uh, in the comment section uh, about Dana, who shows up in so many of my pictures and, and stuff. I don't know if she's watching this. She watches many of them. That was the person who I almost married. That was the person I got close closest to, and uh, I. Uh, I can't say enough about that. I can't say enough about that girl. She's, she's really my best friend. She understands me better than anybody else in the whole wide world. Uh, we just didn't turn out quite being right for each other. This person who owns the airplane with me, who bought the airplane, who I bought the airplane from, wouldn't have the sky arrow without her. The most remarkable, exceptional person I've ever met. And we've been through a lot together. And we are welded together on some level. Um, and that was as close as I got. But I have to say, I am uh, really kind of enjoying what I'm doing now with uh, with this situation and uh, it would be a great day if uh, it gets to the point where I can make that public because it's somebody who's uh, who's got an endless number of pictures on the Google image page and they're pretty impressive pictures and, and I just I think she's cool anyway uh, that's it for the Stratosphere Lounge uh, episode 12 I like the theme so show so much. I loved that sci-fi thing. I just loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. So if we can think of a good topic that we could do the whole evening on, I'm more than happy to do that. So if you feel like during the next week between now and next Wednesday, if you want to come up with a suggestion for a theme night, I don't know if I could do a whole 90 minutes on video games, but there's been a lot of questions about video games. Anything that we can do for theme night I like because I love doing the theme nights. If not, we'll take more of these extraordinarily good questions that I've always enjoyed uh, and just marvel at. Uh, as usual, I'd like to close the show by telling you once again how much all of your support means for, to me, how much looking at this number, which before we started the show was 16,212 likes on Facebook. It's astonishing. Um, and uh, as I always say, I, I read every single comment on Facebook. I don't get to answer nearly as many as I like, but I read them all. And your kindness and your support have been – that's what changed me. That's what changed me from being a feral failure – to being the cross between William F. Buckley and 
Don Draper you see standing before you today, the voice of a generation, and, and a fundamentally happy guy who's living the kind of life that he never imagined was ever going to be possible for him. Uh, owe it all to you. And um, and uh, I saw, I, I'm just glancing over, somebody's talking about John Voight. Johnny Voight is a friend of mine. Johnny Voight is one of the best men that ever lived, and when I do a particularly good firewall or afterburner, I get a phone call or an email from my friend John Voigt saying, oh, Billy, I just had to tell you, I really like that last thing. And your delivery, lad, it's, there's something about your delivery. It's just, it's just really, really good. I really like what you're doing. You hear that coming from a legend like Johnny Voigt, and I'll tell you something, my friends, my life is awfully good and getting better. I owe it all to you. So we'll see you next week on the Stratosphere Lounge, Lucky 13. Uh, you know, and, and by the way, with all the technical problems, funny how they always begin at the beginning, and then the thing just settles down. I can't explain it. Maybe it's because it gets later, you know? It may be that the bandwidth in L.A., right around 6, when we start this thing on the East Coast, is when everybody's coming home and just checking their email or their, or their, um, or their web, you know? Maybe we need to start this thing a little bit later. That might help us. Uh, Somebody said, Clint Eastwood, I hate to be a name dropper. I'm not, I hate to be a name dropper. Who am I kidding? I live for this stuff. Uh, I got to meet Clint Eastwood in a very small group of people. And he's just as quiet and as awesome as you as you might think. And um, and after the this little meeting was over, and I got a chance to talk, I went up to him and I, I took a copy of my book, Silent America, and I, and I ran down to my car and got it out of the trunk and signed it and brought it up. And I said... Uh, Hey, uh, uh, Clint, I just want to tell you, uh, I hope you won't take this as an insult. I'd, I'd, I'd like to just give you this book, not that you'll ever read it, because I know you're a very busy guy, but as a small token of all of the incredible enjoyment that I've gotten out of your work as an actor and as a director. I really, really, really admire uh, the work you do, and thanks. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, read it at my opportunity. And caught up with him again a couple months later. I was just standing in line at, at another event, and uh, I turn around, and there he set, there he stands, and he says, "I read your book. I really liked it." And that's when the poker face goes on, which you get in some practice when 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 you deal with show business and you start meeting uh, movie stars and celebrities. You learn how to put that poker face on there because what you what you what you say is, "Oh, well, thanks, Clint. That's really nice of you. That really means a lot to me. Thank you very much." But what you're really saying inside is, "Jesus H. Christ." Please, what is that? I don't generally go for the maudlin. I like being emotional, but I don't like being sentimental. If anybody out there is watching this and is really going through a rough patch right now, I mean like a rough patch, like a real rough patch, and if you're one of those people that at the moment are so deep in that black hole of despair that you don't see any way out of it and you think that this is the way it's always going to be, you can take it from somebody who's been in that black hole of despair for 20 years when he tells you that you have to hang in there. You have to. You have to hang in there. It will get better. Don't give up. And understand that every moment of, of, of pain and isolation that you're going through now won't necessarily but can be, can be, turned into a source of unbelievable strength and and confidence that will never fail you if you if you make the decision to get through the other side of this. Winston Churchill's said so many brilliant things in his life. I think he's probably with the exception of Twain the most quotable guy in the world. And and Churchill said when you find yourself marching through hell, keep marching. Get to the other side of it. You can find yourself in a state of such despair over finances or, or, un, or, or, or personal relationships or unmet dreams or anything or anything, you will find yourself in a hole that looks like you can't get out of. And, and Joseph Gerber says, how can you say for sure that it will get better? I'm telling you how I can tell you for sure that it will get better. If you're in that place, your perception is effed, okay? Your perception of things at the moment of this blackness and despair is a faulty perception. I'm telling you as a guy who's lived in this. I'm telling you as a guy who, who spent 20 years of his life wondering if anyone would ever go out with him ever, who is now dating a, one of the most spectacular movie stars on, it's not Angelina Jolie kind of thing, but I mean, really. And, and, 
uh, and a new car and all of this ego gratification and all of this financial and professional success, I didn't give up. Now, that doesn't mean that you that I'm telling you that you're going to get to be a celebrity or a pundit or anything like that. What I am telling you, though, is you make a decision to tough it out and get on the other side of this. You make a decision to get and you don't have to decide to get through the next three days, three months, three years, you have to make a decision to get through this evening and get up till tomorrow morning. You make that decision and it will pay off for you. And if you're really feeling that, you can do what I do and find yourself some antidepressants because those things work wonders. Uh, those things change my life. This is the kind of stuff I always thought Stratosphere Lounge would be about, about the personal stuff. If you have battled depression and you find that you are just incapable of getting out of it and you've always thought that antidepressants were a crutch they're not a crutch antidepressants are to mood what insulin is to falling on the ground and passing out from a diabetic coma if you are if you are feeling clinical ongoing depression and you cannot face things and you can't get out of bed in the morning you don't have enough serotonin in your system and just simply getting that physiological problem under some kind of control will give you the time and the emotional um, space to start to get some of the other things that are that are that are a problem under control I don't want to tell you that life is going to turn into sunshine and roses when you wake up tomorrow but I'll tell you this if you don't wake up tomorrow it won't and you can use the suffering as a shield and as a rock that you can put your arms around to say that you get through this, you can get through anything. Life does get better. You just have to let it and you have to make decisions to do it. Make decisions. Talk to friends. Don't trust your perspective if you're really in the hole. Don't trust it. You must have friends. And if you don't find some friends, go to a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. Go to a 12-step meeting. We've gone this far. We might as well go the rest of the way. I was in Narcotics Anonymous for nine months in 1985, and I was one of very few people who went to Narcotics Anonymous and who genuinely did not have a drug problem. I have never had an alcohol problem. I, I, I drink socially. I've never, I've never once in my life bought alcohol for my own consumption at home, ever. I just don't. Don't need it. I've never had a drug problem. I've never really done drugs. I probably smoked pot a couple times in college only because everybody else was and only after they stopped trying to make me do it. Once the peer pressure went away, I decided I'd try it. Didn't like it very much. But I went to Narcotics Anonymous for nine months every single day because I was in such a state of despondency that I needed emergency treatment. And I needed to be around people who were dealing with that kind of uh, desperation two times a day and it did me a world of good. It did me a world of good. I met great people, learned a lot about myself, and I and I I, w I wouldn't be here without it. If you're really in a in a situation where you're where you're really feeling like you don't have anybody to talk to, go to either an AA meeting or an NA meeting and just walk in there and just tell people you're feeling bad and they'll take care of you. Strangers who you've never met before will walk up to you and talk to you in such a way that you believe them. When they tell you, if you have anything you ever want to talk about, you call me and you'll get a sponsor. And a sponsor will be somebody you've never met before, you've known your entire life. And they will be somebody that you can call at 4 o'clock in the morning when you just don't think you can get through the evening. And they will tell you how to get through the next 10 minutes and then the next hour and then the next day. I didn't mean to turn this into a self-help program, but honestly, folks, uh, kind of goes to the whole thing about why you're 53 years old and not married. You're 53 years old and not married because you had, you, I had a bunch of things I needed to work out. But look, this is the point I'm trying to make. I often say, oh my God, I lost, you know, I lost two decades. I didn't lose anything. None of the work that I do would be possible if I hadn't gone through that time, through that, through that agony and that misery. None of the perspective I have, none of the emotional resonance I have, none of the writing I do would have been possible if I hadn't gone walking through that jungle for a long, long time. So how do you, how do you use it? How do you turn it around? How do you, how do you make it work for you? I don't know. 
And if you don't know, find some friends who do know. Find people whose perspective is good. But trust me on this one point, okay? If it really looks dark to you right now, it's not that the world is as dark as you think it is. It's only that your perception of the darkness is so overwhelming. You have to trust me on this. You have to trust me on this. Talk to people. Talk to friends. Talk to people and get their advice. I've had probably three interventions in the course of my life, and they saved me. You're worth saving. If you're listening to this show, you're worth saving. The rest of those swine can go jump in a river. I don't care. You people I care about. Kirk needs his pain. You're exactly right, Doug Miles. Go look at that Star Trek episode where Kirk gets split into two pieces, the vicious, violent, nasty half, transporter malfunction, and there's this animalistic Kirk that comes back, and there's sweet, kind, noble, happy, sympathetic Kirk, and sympathetic Kirk is weak and powerless. He needs his pain because his overcoming of his pain is what makes his character. And the more pain you overcome, the more character you end up with. I believe this in my bones. Well, that was a small little addition to the Stratosphere Lounge, but to be honest with you folks, not only do I not mind talking about these kind of things, I like talking about them. I don't talk about them on TV. I don't talk about them on my job. I talk about them with you uh, through Facebook because you interrupt interrupt. You interact with me on a personal level. So there you go. Any questions like this you want to ask, bring them out, trot them out. It's interesting and it's fun. It's a good break for me. I'm tired of talking about politics. When I want this election to be over. I want the country back and go back to barbecuing and working on the movie. This has been the Stratosphere Lounge, episode 12. It's been a pleasure talking to you fine people. We'll look for you next week. We'll see you Wednesday. I'm Bill Whittle. Take care now. Bye-bye. And hang in there.